the topic that, I, that we have before us this morning is we overcome. We overcome by sowing seed even during difficult times. And so I want to invite you to turn with me to Matthew chapter 13. We're going to read the text there. And we're talking about difficult times. Anybody had any difficult times lately? It's been very difficult. It's been all of these, these things that have happened have really been a diversion too for us. Uh, it's just been hard to get back on track. So uh, this is a great place to start. We've got an exciting week that has been planned here and a lot of prayer and preparation has been put into it. And uh, we're going to start, I think, at the, one of the best places to start. And then we've got an incredible lineup of preachers that are going to expand on this all week. We've got all kinds of seminars and opportunities and youth conference. It's just going to be a great week. And I know the Lord wants to do a lot in us so he can do a lot through us. All right, read with me. Now, you can sit, you can stand, you can do whatever you feel comfortable doing. If you want to stand, you can stand while we read this. You're not more spiritual if you stand or set or whatever just you'd feel freedom to do what you feel led to do so Matthew chapter 13 verse 1 says the same day Jesus went out of the house and sat by the seaside and a great multitude were gathered together unto him so that he went into a ship and sat and the whole multitude a multitude stood on the shore and he spake many things unto them in parables saying behold a sower went forth to sow and when he sowed, some seeds fell by the wayside, and the fowls came and devoured them up. Some fell upon stony places where they had not much earth, and forthwith they sprung up because they had no deepness of earth. And when the sun was up, they were scorched, and because they had no root, they withered away. And some fell among thorns, and the thorns sprang up and choked them. But other fell into good ground and brought forth fruit, some a hundredfold, some sixtyfold, some thirtyfold. Who hath ears to hear? Let him hear. Amen. Amen. This whole thing about sowing seed, even, even during difficult times, is at the heart of what we're all about. This is the mission that he's called us to. And it's all about, as most of you know, it's all about spreading the gospel. It's all about taking the gospel to everywhere we can all over this planet. It's the main thing. You know, it's been said a lot that one of the things we need to focus on is keeping the main thing the main thing. It's easy to get distracted, especially with so many important things. And there are a lot of important issues. There are a lot of important biblical truths for which we must stand. But there's nothing as important as this. And that is spreading the gospel to those who need to hear it, those who are lost everywhere, anytime, any place, no matter who they are or where they are. This is what God's called us to do. And, and we want to keep this front and center. Because there's some things that people have to know, they have to hear, they have to understand, and they have to believe if they're going to be saved. They're primary things that they need to know. Then there are some secondary things that may not be necessary for salvation, but you need to know them and grow in them if you're going to mature as a believer. And then there are some things that are not quite as crucial, but if we're not careful, sometimes we like to major on the minors and then we end up minoring on the majors. So we want to keep the main thing the main thing. And with everything that's going on in our world today, not just with the pandemic, but with just all of the craziness, I, I believe there's more crazy people in the world today than there ever has been. Might be some of them here, I don't know, but... <laughs> Uh, the wickedness, just, just the stuff that's just right out there. Sometimes we find ourselves feeling more like, come quickly, Lord Jesus, right? I mean, it's easy to get kind of the mindset that, you know, Lord, our world, and we see what's going on is getting so bad that you just need to come down here and, and just judge this world, right? You know, as it's been said before, that otherwise he may have to apologize to Sodom and Gomorrah, Right? But you know what? It's not the wickedness of the world that Jesus said would trigger the end. I mean, sometimes we think it's just getting so bad. Hey, and we know by what's happening, it's like one old preacher said to me the other day. He says, you know, we're way over yonder in the back of that book now. 
We're getting way over there. I believe that. That's right. That's right. But it's not the wickedness of the world that Jesus said would trigger the end. What he said is in Matthew chapter 24, verse, verse 14. He, hold, he told his disciples, he said, And this gospel of the kingdom shall be preached in all the world for a witness unto all nations. And then shall the end come. It's easy to just, and I, and I get it, it's easy to just feel like, Lord, with everything going on and as crazy as things are and as wicked as everything is, Lord, I'm just ready to get on the bus and go home. But Jesus is saying, I'm counting on you and I'm waiting on you to fill that bus up. That's what we're here for. Sowing seed, this is the mission that he gave us to spread the gospel. That's what this whole story is about. That's what Jesus meant when he told his disciples, including us, to go and to make disciples of all the nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, right? Teaching them to observe all the things he commanded us. And he said that he would be with us until he comes to get us. I don't know who needs to hear that, but I need to hear that. It's the same thing he was saying as recorded in Acts 1.8 when he said that we're going to receive power. You're not just going to have my word, but you're going to have my presence in you through the person of God, the Spirit, the Holy Spirit in us. You're going to receive power and you, you are going to be witnesses. What does a witness do? A witness testifies. He testifies or she testifies to what they know, what they've seen, what they've heard, what they felt. You're going to be witnesses and you're going to start where you are and in the surrounding area to the very end of the earth every nook and cranny I kind of know what a nook is I'm not sure what a cranny is but I think it means all of it right every bit of it and Jesus told the disciples after his resurrection before he ascended he said this he said as the father sent me into the world so send I you so it's his mission we talk about missions all the time but it's really the mission it's his mission, and he commissions us to carry on his mission. That's what this is about, and that's what we're about. And it's got to stay front and center, no matter what other things are happening around us. The enemy is always wanting to divert us, even to some good causes. That's not the main cause that we're here. Why did he leave us here? Why didn't he just take us home once we got saved? It's because he has a work that he wants to do in us and through us. So these have been difficult days. A lot of pastors here this morning, and you can say amen. Feel free, say amen. I'm not sure if I can hear you or not, uh, but say it anyway. But if, if you're not a pastor, you need to know this, or if you're listening online, you need to know that these have been really tough days for your pastor. With this pandemic, all of us have felt the strain we, of just feeling ineffective and just trying to gain traction. It's, it's been... It's been uh, tough times and we've had to learn to adapt and to make adjustments because we're still going to carry on what he left us here to do right it's not been easy but we've had to adjust our schedules and adjust many things to continue doing what he left us here to do we've been knocked off those routines and I don't know about you but I've struggled with this a little bit because sometimes I found that maybe I was a little bit more attached to my routines and my preferences and my schedules then maybe sometimes I am just being led by the Spirit of God using the Word of God I mean, we all have those, and we all struggle with those things. And sometimes I have to admit that I struggle a little bit between what is spiritual and what is sentimental. I mean, there are some things that we do and some things that are precious to me that may not be super scriptural, but it's the way it's always been in my life. And I realize that most of the people that we're trying to reach don't have these experiences. There's some songs that are precious to me. Not that there's just so deep in scripture, but I can remember sitting on my granny's lap when I was just a little guy, my great grandma, and, and hearing her sing those songs in her falsetto voice. You know how, how older women used to do that? Usually I'd already gotten in trouble and gotten disciplined and I was in her lap and just going, <laughs> you know, like that. But, uh, and it's so good to have mom and dad here drove over from Rosebud, Arkansas and my two brothers. And they'll tell you, I, I may still hold the record for getting in trouble the most and getting the most whippings in church probably. Yeah, back in those days at Mount Bethel Church there in Rosebud. 
That's how I ended up in the ministry. I think they just beat the devil right out of me. I'm kidding. I'm kidding. I don't mean that. I'm just seeing if you're paying attention. But, uh, but I'm glad I've got that sentiment. I'm so glad. It's powerful in my life. But yet I realize so many people don't have that. In fact, a lot of the people we're trying to reach have a worldview that's totally opposite of what we hold dear. They do not have a biblical worldview. The way they view life, the way they view everything is so different. And starting at square one is the gospel. We have to introduce them to the gospel. And it's easy to get attached to methods and styles and programs that are adaptable. And not focus on the message and the substance and the purpose, which never changes and never will change. So this is what he's called us to do and to mobilize the gospel any way that we can. We've been worried and we're praying for safety this week. We've been worried about a virus and all, all of that. But I have to ask myself, how contagious are we with the gospel? Is pretty much anybody that comes in contact with us going to get exposed to the gospel? Here's what we know is that our Lord has already overcome. We don't have to go around defeated. He has overcome. He has conquered death. He has conquered sin. He has conquered the grave. And he has called us and empowered us to be salt in a decaying world and light in a dark world. And so Jesus gives this story, and he's telling us kind of what it's going to be like as we carry on this mission, as we spread the gospel, that there's some people that are going to be saved and radically changed, and you're going to be surprised who some of them are. I'm sure in the early days that no one would have voted young Saul of Tarsus anything but public enemy number one to the believers. And who would have thought that he would have become the great missionary and God would use him to write scripture? I mean, this is a guy that was, and be a missionary to the Gentiles. He was so prejudiced being a Pharisee and growing up the way he did against everyone else. See, this is what the Lord can do. So we have to watch out. We have to realize that some of those people out there that offend us so badly, you never know. Hey, that's the mission field, right? That's not the enemy. We know who the real enemy is. We wrestle not against flesh and blood, right? That's the mission field. He's empowered us to overcome. Now, I, I noticed that it says here that uh, the same day Jesus went out of the house, he sat down by the sea, a great multitude gathered to him. And it was like there wasn't enough room, so he went into a ship. He made use of whatever tools that he had. There was a ship there, so he got on the ship, and everybody could get on the shore, and he could preach to them. He made use of a tool. And I think I want to I use every tool that the Lord puts in my hand to be able to teach and to preach and to spread the gospel and to reach people and minister to people. Because uh, I'll guarantee you this, the enemy is using every tool he can get his hands on. You know, it's not that Satan's any more powerful today. He's just got more tools to work with, right? I mean, think about it. You can gossip and bear false witness and things like that at the speed of light now. All around the world with these things. Anyway, uh, in Revelation chapter 12, he tells us in verse 11 about overcoming says, and they overcame him by the blood of the lamb and by the word of their testimony, and they loved not their lives unto death. They loved not their lives unto the death. We go around singing victory in Jesus, and yet we are way too defeated too much of the time. The saints overcame. Now, this scene is set where Satan and his angels are cast down to the earth and it says that the saints overcame by three things there were three things the blood of the lamb so the ones who are sowing the seed are the ones who have received the seed did you get that it, applying it back to to this story Jesus told who are the ones sowing the seed the ones who have received the seed that he has chosen those who he whom he has redeemed by the blood of the lamb to be the very ones to carry on this mission he didn't choose angels he didn't choose him once it's it's folks like us they overcame by the blood of the lamb that they had been saved. He, Christ is their atonement. He is the, the, the atoning sacrifice. And the word of their testimony, which is our continued witness. 
That's what a witness does is testify the word and it's the word of the testimony. As we sow gospel seed, as we sow, as we go, we are overcoming through that word. It's the witness, it's the testimony. And also he says, uh, through continued faithfulness, they love not their own lives, even unto the death that we continue faithfully. May we be able to say like Luther's great hymn that says we will not fear. Amen? God has willed his truth to triumph through us. The prince of darkness grim, we tremble not for him. His rage we can endure for lo, his doom is sure. One little word shall fell him. Amen. That's powerful. That's true. Well, let's look at this seed for a moment. We know that the seed that is used here in this story that Jesus told represents the word of the kingdom. And we know that because he tells us in verse 19 that anyone that hears the word of the kingdom, that's the gospel. That's the word of God. And the gospel of the kingdom is, could be likened, it's been said, to a seed for several reasons. First of all, like a seed, it has life within itself, right? The word of God is alive and powerful. This is not like reading or studying Shakespeare or anything else, right? Because the very author who wrote these words wants to come live inside of us and actually empower us to understand and apply and live out the truths on this page. It's not like anything else. It's alive, it's powerful, it has life within itself. And also, we know that um, it produces fruit. And like a seed, it needs to be planted. That's the illustration he's giving here. And watered and cultivated if it's going to be har produce a harvest. And also, uh, that uh, it will produce fruit. God's word will not return to him empty or void, right? So it's the word of God. It's, it's, it's not all on us. It's his word. It's his power, his presence, his spirit. We need to be faithful with it. And you know, I think this teaching and, and, and this, this illustration that Jesus used and is used several times in scripture, it may be what Peter had in mind later on when he talked about this in 1 Peter uh, chapter 1, verse 23, when he said, we've been born again of this seed, right? We've been born again, not of corruptible seed, but of incorruptible by the word of God that lives and abides forever. We have to have the word of God if we're going to be born again. And this is all about the gospel. It's the gospel. This is all about the simple gospel. And we realize that the, we get tangled up in so many different things, but what people need is the gospel. And the word gospel means good news. That's right. Good news. And that this whole book from Genesis, we believe in it, don't we? Always heard Zig Ziglar say we believe in this from Genesis to maps. You know, we've all got maps in the back of our Bible. We believe it word for word, every word inspired by God. That this book is really the unfolding story of the gospel. And since this book is the unfolding story of the gospel, let's unfold a little bit of it today. How about it? All right? Because we find out as we get into this that this story started even before Genesis 1-1. That Jesus was the lamb slain from before the foundation of the world. You now people say, well, why would God... Why would God, if he knows all things and can do all things, why would he create us and put us here knowing that we would sin? I mean, it seems like maybe a flaw in God's plan. No. As we'll find out, it's because God wanted a unique relationship with us. What blows my mind more than anything is knowing what it would cost him. Knowing what you would do and what I would do and how much it would cost him to save you and save me that somehow even in eternity past though he knew he still thought you were worth it. That I was worth it. I can't get over that. I don't know about you. But the gospel it's the good news. Well if there's good news it means there must also be bad news. Right? Because Without the bad news, the good news isn't good news, it's just news. 
And the bad news is, the Bible tells us in the gospel, let me just say, let's just lay it out there. Jesus' words, he said that God so loved the world, John 3, 16. God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. God gave that the whole world could believe. Whosoever, we believe that, amen? Amen. And and we're preaching this free will, free grace, free salvation. That's good news. But it's only good news because there's also bad news. And the bad news is the Bible tells us that all of us have sinned in Romans 3.23. That all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. All of us are sinners. Now, a lot of people today just want to think that somehow when we're judged, God's just going to weigh our good against our bad. And just as long as my good outweighs my bad somehow, right? And and other people will say, well, you know, you talk to them, well, I'm as good as uh, so-and-so. And and, and I don't know who so-and-so is, but their name always comes up. Oh, so-and-so, it goes to your church there. You know what? In judgment, God's not going to say, come here, so-and-so. Yeah, you know, you are. He's not doing that. What does the scripture say? That unless you and I measure, we all fall short. We come short of the glory, the perfection of God. That is, unless you in your mind and in your thoughts and in your actions and in your attitude, unless you're as perfect as God himself, unless you're as perfect as Jesus, you fall short. You don't measure up. You're a sinner. You're lost. That's the bad news that the world has to know. And then further than that, Romans 6, 23 says, then the wages of sin is death. Aren't you glad that verse doesn't stop right there? (laughs) But the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. Wages of sin is death. God told Adam and Eve, the day you sin, you'll surely die. Well, we know they didn't die physically that day, but they did die spiritually. Death in the Bible doesn't mean annihilation. It doesn't mean an end. Death always means separation. When we die the physical death is when our soul, spirit, separates from our physical body. We are, before that, we are spiritually dead. That is, we are separated from God. The Bible speaks of a second death, an eternal death, where people are separated by, from their, by their own choice. They're separated from God forever in a place the scripture refers to as outer darkness or a lake of fire. So this is real. Wages of sin is death. And we see that day in the Garden of Eden that there was a death that occurred as Adam and Eve tried to cover themselves and God himself shed the first blood as an animal was slain and he took the skin and clothed and covered their nakedness. Our efforts to try to cover ourselves never work. You have to come to God God's way, the way he has provided. This is also illustrated with Cain and Abel. Cain tried to just worship God the way he wanted to. You have to come to God on God's terms. He didn't do that. And he didn't illustrate the wages of sin being death and have a substitute sacrifice for himself. And evidently Cain knew what was right because God said, if you do right, won't yours be accepted? So he knew what was right, but he wasn't willing to do it. And we see the wages of sin being death. And we see immediately God providing a covering way back there in the beginning of the book. And the wages of sin being death. But I'm glad that he said the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. That's a gift. Now a gift is something someone else pays for, right? You get a gift that you've always wanted and then you get a bill in the mail the next week. You need to start asking questions because I think you just got conned. Someone else pays for a gift, but you have to receive the gift. Someone can give you a gift, but you have to receive it and take it to yourself. The gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. How do you receive that gift? There's only one way, the Bible tells us, and that's in Ephesians chapter 2, verse 8. I know you know this. This is the gospel, though. It never gets old. It never gets boring, right? If you think this is boring, it's because you're boring. It's not boring, okay? For by grace are you saved. Hey, that's the gift that he paid for that we couldn't earn, we couldn't deserve. And we receive it how? For by grace are you saved through faith. We receive it by faith. It's more than just believing these facts are true. It's all about submitting, trusting, relying totally upon him. That doesn't, and then they said that not of yourselves. It is a gift of God. So we find out that we're created in God's image. 
Because God created human beings different than everything, differently than everything else, right? God wanted a relationship with us, a love relationship with us. He didn't make us so that we were programmed like the animals with instinct. The animals just pretty much do what they're designed to do. They've been affected by the curses and the fall as well, but the animals kind of do what they're supposed to do. He didn't want us to be like robots or puppets, but if you're going to have a real love relationship, there has to be a choice. You can't force someone or program someone to love you and have that relationship. In order to have that, it involved our being created in God's image. And part of that, that's not referring to physical image, but mind, will, and emotion. We have a will. We have an ability, a responsibility to choose and to make choices. God chose to love us, but it's not a complete love relationship unless we choose to love back. That's why the tree of the knowledge of good and evil stood in the midst of the Garden of Eden as a symbol of God's ownership and of mankind's free will, of God's sovereignty and our responsibility. And as we know, we chose sin. And because God is absolutely perfect and holy, he couldn't just overlook that sin. One sin could not be allowed into his presence or God would no longer be holy, God would no longer be perfect, God would no longer be God. But because human beings are made in the image of God, that means there's a God-shaped hole inside all of us, right? That can only be filled with that for which we were created, a relationship with him. As mankind turned away from God, we try to fill that with all kinds of other things, all kinds of sinful things, all kinds of other relationships and pride and self. And, and that's what the whole Tower of Babel was about. Exalting ourselves against God, trying to do this another way. Sin always brings death, destruction, and division. God divided everybody up. Listen, it's the gospel that unites. We're talking about being united. It's the gospel that unites people from everywhere in every social class and brings them together into one body of Christ. Right there in the Garden of Eden, though, God promised that there was someone coming, that the seed of the woman was going to come and crush the enemy's head. The seed of the woman. Now, that doesn't seem to make sense, but it's still good theology, and it's still good science even. But when you find out that usually the seed belongs to the man, right? But unless this means that this one is going to be born of a virgin by the supernatural power of God, the seed of the woman is going to come and crush the enemy's head. And then we find in Genesis chapter 12, God singles out a man named Abraham. And through his seed, that there's somebody going to be coming, and through this one, he's going to be a blessing to everyone else. All nations are going to be blessed because of him. Well, Abraham believed God and trusted God. Abraham decided that he wanted in on this, and we know he believed and trusted God because he was willing to go and do what God said, even though it didn't make any sense. And as you know, through Abraham, God singled out a people. And through those people, Israel, that he gave his laws, his statutes, and his commandments. And also, instructions little bit more detailed about that sacrifice that they had to have in order to have fellowship with this perfect God that is they had to come before God confessing wages of sin as death as they had the blood sacrifice every time you think about it there had to be a substitute because we're sinners God was teaching that as an object lesson even with Abraham and Isaac when God stopped him from offering his son and provided a substitute right but the law laid this out and all these things from the Passover lamb to the feast and to the tabernacle all are like telling us something that's going to happen. And Paul says later on, they're like shadows cast by something that's in the future that was coming. Israel continued along in their rebellion and division and they failed to be a light to the rest of the world like God wanted them to be. But God continued through the Psalms and the prophets speaking forth his truth especially that about this deliverer who was to come so God's response was to love and keep on loving even though people despised his laws his covenants and his statutes but then we find out in the fullness and people need to know about this that in the fullness of the time God sent forth his son that the promised deliverer came the seed of the woman the seed of Abraham that Paul tells us later on was referring to one seed, similar, uh, singular, Christ. He came. 
He's God's sacrifice for us, the substitute atonement covering for all of us. So much so that when John the Baptist saw Jesus coming, he said, Behold, the Lamb of God that takes away the sin of the world. This is the Lamb that God gives. This is the permanent solution right here. And so he is the one, the only one qualified to be our deliverer. It's so amazing that the scripture talked about this Savior, this Messiah, this deliverer who would come and he arrives, we find out it's none other than God himself, God the Son, fully God, yet fully human, that God himself is going to be our deliverer, that God himself has lived and walked on planet earth in human flesh in real time. God himself has experienced all kinds of temptation, just like you and frustrations, just like you and I do, yet without sin. We, we, we have a God who knows he knows all things, but he knows what it's like to be in the flesh and rejected and hurt by other people. He knows perfect humanity and undiminished deity in one person. This is part of that precious truth that comes out of Scripture. And because of that, his life showed us how to live. And Paul says that he actually fulfilled the righteous requirement of the law on our behalf. <laughs> really? I mean, all, 2 Corinthians 5, 21, that our sin was put on him. He became sin for us who knew no sin that we might become the righteous of God because of him. What an exchange. He took my sin and paid the eternal price for it. And then you and I get his righteousness deposited into our account. This is the solution that God had. And, and because of his resurrection, we have power for new life, not just the promise of our own resurrection. It is through Christ that we enter into this. This is the good news that overcomes the bad news. This is what overcomes everything. This is the gospel. This is the precious seed that we bear. This is what has the power to change people's lives. People who view the world so differently that once they understand this and once they embrace Christ as their Savior and their Lord, that everything changes. Their minds begin, our minds begin to get renewed by Him. Well, this whole thing that we're talking about is so exciting. May we be like the missionary doctor. Many years ago, many, many years ago, I heard about that was in this area of China and he was able to remove the cataracts from a poor farmer's eyes. He'd been blind, but then he could see. A few days later, he looked out the window and here came that farmer holding a rope. And on holding onto that rope was a whole line of blind people that he was bringing to that doctor that worked a miracle. Amen. We ought to be just that excited about bringing other people to Jesus who has opened our eyes and given us life. Well, that's the seed, uh, the gospel, the soil really quickly uh, because Jesus, what he gives us in this parable is really a general statement. Now, as preachers, we like to just kind of make this thing walk on all fours, right? We like to just kind of bring this, you know, but there's some general statements that you need to know this as you spread the gospel. This is generally what's going to happen. Some of the seed as it spread fell on the wayside, the road or the path. And that represents the hard heart. I had an old Bible that I'd written some notes down that I had when I was a teenager. These four hearts. The, the calloused heart, the casual heart, the crowded heart, and the converted heart. But I'm not going to use that outline, but we're just kind of mentioning this. Uh, but this was the calloused heart. It was a hard heart. This is someone that didn't want to understand. Now, it's not the fault of the sower. It's not the fault of the seed. It was the fault of the soil that this seed did never germ germinate and was stolen away. Jesus tells us later that it's like those who don't want to hear. They don't want to understand. Their hearts are hardened. And, and in fact, when the, the disciples ask him about why he's speaking in parables, he quotes later on in verse 14 from Isaiah 6, 9, and 10. And he says in verse 15, this, this people's heart is what the King James says, waxed gross. What does that mean? That's one word in the original, and it literally means to thicken or to fatten. Their hearts have hardened. He says, he says that uh, their ears are dull of hearing. Their eyes, they've closed. The thing about it is, is they don't want to hear. They don't want to see. They don't want to believe until the point comes that they can't see and can't believe. That's a hard heart. And then the stony ground, as you know, is good topsoil, but it's not very deep. These aren't hardened and don't resist it. I mean, they get all excited. They may believe Jesus died on the cross. They may believe he rose again, and they want to go to heaven and sign me up. Amen. But you know what? It says they receive the word quickly with joy. And joy is one of the fruits of the Spirit, but joy is not the distinguishing feature of salvation here. Fruitfulness is. 
These are the people who want Jesus to fix. Lord, just make me a better me, right? These are people who want Jesus to just take away my problems and fix my problems, right? Uh, but what Jesus really wants to do is fix them in their heart. They give Jesus access to the outer layers, but never to the heart. These are people who want Jesus to save them, but don't necessarily want Jesus to be Lord of their life. They wither away. When things get tough, they wither away. And then there's the ground with the thorns, which is the crowded heart. And you know the thorns and the briars and the weeds, that's what grows naturally. I mean, even good soil, will, this will crop up. And we know that because of our sinful nature, we've got to be mindful of this. And it became crowded and it choked out the fruitfulness. Matthew mentions the cares of this world, deceitfulness of riches. That's our culture today, folks. Mark adds a third, the lust or desire of other things. And Luke mentions the pleasures of this life. These are things that will choke out the seed we need to be mindful of. This is just kind of basically what happens as the gospel comes in contact with the hearts of people. Then some of it's going to be good ground. And it's going to take hold. It's going to germinate. It's going to grow. And it's going to produce a harvest. And then that harvest can be used to spread to others. And there's different degrees of the harvest here. But you know what? It's our responsibility not to be soil inspectors. It's our responsibility to be... Seed sowers. Are y'all ready to wrap this up? There's some seasons also that are mentioned. I noticed, and I just want to quickly mention this, in Mark's rendering of this, in Mark chapter 4, he throws in a little parable that's like, what? What's he saying here? He said, the kingdom of God is if a man should scatter seed on the ground, he sleeps and rises night and day, and the seed sprouts and grows. He knows not how. The earth produces fruit by itself. First the blade, then the ear, then the full grain in the ear. And then when the grain is ripe at once, he puts in the sickle and harvest has come. Okay, yeah, well, okay. In the context of what Jesus is telling there, what's this all about? Well, we know the field's the world, right? The heart represents the, uh, the soil represents the heart of mankind. But we know God is everywhere. Amen? And God is at work everywhere. And the field is everywhere, so that means the potential for sowing seed and the potential for a harvest is everywhere, all around us, starting at your house, in your family, in your community, in your state, in your nation, in every place in the world. That's where. And he's telling us there's a process here. There's a process. It's sown, it grows, and then at some point, you don't really understand how it's all going to happen, uh, but then, then it's time for harvest. And I think he's telling us there are seasons. You know, there's winter time when you think nothing's happening, but really the freezing and thawing prepares the soil. There might be times you think, well, they're hardened and they're not listening, but you never know what God is doing to prepare a heart, right? We need to be ready for springtime when it's time for plowing and time for planting. There may be some of us that are, and we can all do all of this, but some of us may be especially gifted at sowing the seed, at sharing the gospel, at explaining the gospel. There may be others of you that during the season of summer are really good at helping cultivate and watering. You may be in the irrigation ministry. Then there are some, and all of us can do all of these things, but there are some that seem to be especially gifted at knowing when it's just right to get the sickle and the harvest is ready. That There are some of those that are really gifted to know when someone's heart is right and they're ready to make that commitment to Christ and to receive that gift of salvation. And we're all involved, and I think that's what he's saying is, here's the problem, is in the body of Christ today, we're more interested in our own needs and our own comfort and our own preferences than we are the Lord's harvest. That there are millions of people around us that are going to die and spend eternity in hell separated from God, and, and nothing's going to change without what we have coming into their life, what we know, what we can share. This is what we're called to do. Well, the last thing I want to say involves this final harvest, a final harvest. In this passage, Jesus gives another story, and I'm not going to go through it. I'm just going to mention it. I'm just going to mention time is running out. I mean, not just for this sermon, which it is, but I mean, time is running out. There's less time than there's ever been to share the gospel. He gives us that story about the wheat and the tares, about the end of the age, and that God is going to send forth his angels and there's going to be a harvest of the earth that he's going to reap the earth. In this story, it talks about how that the enemy, which is Satan, came along and he sowed imitation wheat, which is called tares there. Possibly was Darnell wheat, which looks just like the real thing until it begins to produce the head. Then you find out it's different. And uh, so at this point, the workers, hey, there's tares in the wheat. 
And what they wanted to do is say, can we go, you remember that? Can we go uproot? You want us to go uproot those? And do you remember what the Lord of the harvest said? He said, no, lest gathering the tares, you root up some of the wheat along with them. And then verse 30, Matthew 13, he says, let both grow together until the harvest. And in the time of the harvest, I will say to the reapers, gather ye together first the tares and bind them in bundles to burn them. But gather the wheat into my barn. Now listen to me as we wrap this up. If we're not careful, we can become far more passionate about trying to root up and root out all the evil around us than we are about sowing the seed of the gospel into their hearts. That's what he's called us to do. He himself is going to come here and root it up and divide it up one of these days. What you and I are to do is keep loving people and keep standing up for the truth and sharing the truth and love and keep sowing the gospel seed. Some are going to hear and going to receive it and grow. Some are going to seem to and some are going to resist it. And some of them that sow against their worldview, they're going to be antagonistic about it. But guess what? You read the end of the book, we overcome because our Lord has overcome. And so this is what God wants us to do is focus of sowing the gospel seed into the hearts of all kinds of people, cultivating it, watering it so it produces fruit that in turn produces more fruit that produces yet more fruit. We're planting, we're, we're, we're sowing, amen, and we're watering and we're harvesting. Repeat, right? And we are planting, we are watering, we are harvesting. Repeat until kingdom come. That is until he comes back and gets us. He told us to pray till his kingdom come. We'll pray his kingdom come and he said you do this and you keep doing this and you stay at it and when I'm ready I will come and I will get you and I will stop you let's keep sowing the seed let's keep walking in victory because he overcame we also overcome through him